All right, everybody, we got a very big one for this week's dissecting design. We're going to be taking a look at Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, and how it, quite frankly, is a broken and easy game, because we're going all in on the clickbait this time. The footage that you're seeing is taken from a recorded play I did off stream, and I will be fast forwarding and maybe speeding things up if need be. Considering how speed dependent this game is, it, we don't want to do too much in terms of speeding up the gameplay because I will mess with the timing. But let's begin with the basics. Sekiro Shadows Out Twice is the latest game from From Software, and this combines action with stealth gameplay. Some have equated to the Tenchu series and less of a Souls like, and we may talk about that one later in this piece. But right now, we are in the opening. And as with all From Software games, the tutorial itself is designed as its own segment in the game space. And we'll return to this actual area later on in the game, but it will be different. Right now we have no health whatsoever, and we actually can't attack. Now if I was speedrunning this, I could just run straight through and try to dodge attacks best I could, but I was trying to do things as by the book as possible. But as the footage is going to get forward here, we're going to show off the basics of combat as well as some of the opening fights. So the general gameplay here, as with the previous souls likes, we do get an infinite healing in the form of the medicinal gourd or the healing gourd. We'll be able to enhance this later on in the game to allow us more swigs to take down, but the only ways it gets recharged is by returning to a checkpoint or sculptor's idol, and that respawns all the minor enemies. As we open up this door here, combat is built heavily on defensive play. Every enemy has a health bar and a posture bar. And you didn't see that there as I did a stealth attack there. But attacking an enemy will raise posture and lower health. If the enemy blocks or parries, they will only take posture damage. When the posture bar is filled, like right here, you can perform a death blow. And the death blow is an instant kill on all minor enemies. Now, I have three major forms of defense in Sekiro. I can block an attack, which basically just lets the attack go through, like right there, and gives me posture. If I time the block, that's when you see that kind of like orange, like kind of like sparks fly. That's a deflect. And that causes increased posture damage and reduces the amount of posture I take. And then I can dodge out of the way. The dodge is very risky. You have very limited iframes to make use of it, and it really can only work on vertical slashes. So when this guy does that, when he did that vertical slasher, I could have dodged around, but parrying and more specifically deflecting is definitely one of your best tools for learning this game. Now, I can also jump out of the way of horizontal base attacks, and that becomes a major part that you'll see in the first quote-unquote boss fight. Now, killing a made, or I'm sorry, killing a mini boss will usually reward you with progression items, and we'll talk about that when the time comes. But I hope you all notice that this is a lot more vertical or agility focus compared to the Soulsborne series, which kept the player on the ground and really locked them in terms of map and level design. Here, you are given a lot more freedom of movement. Now, this is our first kind of non-human enemy, and the enemies in Sekiro will vary between humanoid, which is the bulk of them, as well as some monster or non-human base enemies. And you'll see those later in the video. But, as the footage continues to play, we're about to get to the first real test of Sekiro. And as with a From Solver tradition, we're going to be fighting a boss that is way above our weight limit, and is supposed to kill us. But guess what, he's not going to kill me, as a spoiler here. And you're going to see that footage coming up now. But this is going to be the fight with Genshiro. 
And he is definitely going to be the character that's going to be the bane of your existence when learning Sekiro. We'll talk more about his design later, when we're supposed to play him for real. But we can use this as a case to kind of watch all the lessons of the tutorial. Notice also, right there, that kanji symbol? That represents unblockable attacks. When that happens, your only options are to either parry the move, or perform the correct defensive action, like right there when I did that jump kick. But I want everyone to pay attention during this fight. You're going to see how I'm breaking Sekiro as I'm fighting this guy. So, hopefully you're keeping an eye out for this, but I'm focusing heavily on deflecting attacks. If you attack an enemy or a boss class enemy in Sekiro, they will always auto-block your attacks. If you keep attacking them, they will uh, do their own deflection. And that is a very major part, like what you saw right there. Now, as you can see, the posture bar is filling up at the top of the screen. The posture bar's rate of decline is based on the health of the character. If your health is above 75%, your posture bar will recover very fast. When it's below 75, and even especially below 50, it will not recover anywhere near as fast. And that goes for Sekiro as well. Now, as this fight is playing out, again, you're not supposed to be winning this fight at this level of the game, and everyone who plays this game day one is gonna lose against Shiro here. It's just a commonality. Now right there, very important thing to point out. I did a jump, and it showed me above the sword thrust, but that was the incorrect defense move, and I got punished for it. And Sekiro is really about punishing when you mess up. You'll be, we'll be talking more about that one later. Some attacks can interrupt the enemy, but, other, but most of them cannot and you do not have animation cancels in Sekiro. Now, as you've noticed so far, I've been playing things very methodically, or trying to, and at this point in this fight, I am one hit away from dying, or quote-unquote dying, because you can't die in this tutorial. While this continues to play out, I also want to talk briefly about the kind of design of Sekiro in terms of enemies. Now, as with all the From Software games recently, Sekiro features a random pattern design. What that means is that the enemy has a set number of attack combos that he or she will do, but the actual order and frequency of these attacks is entirely dictated by the engine. So I don't know what Genshiro or any of the other enemies in the game are going to do at any given moment. I can only know what their attack patterns are. And that plays a lot into the design or the challenge of Sekiro. That if this is very much a game built on following what the enemy is going to do and react to it. And I'm going to talk more about that breakdown later on when there's some downtime in the footage. But as things continue to play out, again, I'm not supposed to be able to beat him at this stage in the game. And right now, I am one hit away from dying. But that posture baller is growing, and in a few seconds, it will be over. And again, notice how the posture is not declining at anywhere near the normal speed, because his health is below half. Now, there we go. So with that, by the law of Sekiro, I am now the greatest Sekiro player in the game for at least one hour. So, all of you are now forced to listen to me, and cannot argue anything that I say. But this is a special uh, part of this cutscene that plays by the fact that you were able to beat the tutorial, and then it goes back to normal. Unfortunately, no matter how well we play, we lose our arm in the process. But, we're going to speed things up a little bit and talk more about the stealth gameplay as we go through some of the opening areas. The stealth in Sekiro is a bit on the basic side. Enemies essentially have two patterns. There is a patrolling one, and then a stationary. If an enemy is stationary, they will usually not respond to anything unless they start to see you. 
There are ceramic shards or pottery that you can throw to kind of distract enemies, but it only works, I believe, on patrolling enemies. Again, I didn't really use that too much because I wasn't relying on items here. But as we go forward, the general rule of stealth is that once an enemy has spy you, they will alert all nearby enemies. There are a few quote unquote guards who are alarm enemies who will also do the same. If you leave an area, the enemies will go back to their basic pattern. And that is a major point when you're dealing with mini bosses. The mini bosses of Sekiro exist in the world itself. There are no more fog doors, at least not in the traditional sense. And you can weed out all the minor enemies in an area before going after the boss. What I picked up right there is a prosthetic tool that you're not going to see me use any of them in this game because I'm such a ninja badass. But we'll be talking about their importance later on in this video. Now, right here we have kind of a quote-unquote tutorial on using stealth on a mini boss, and that's this guy right here. And by making that noise, it did alert him, and he's going to now try and engage me. Notice the two red dots in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, as those mean he has two health bars. Now, what I'm doing right here is I am backing up and getting out of his detection radius. When his health bar disappears in the upper left, he will disengage. First we have a giant chicken that apparently wanted to get into a fight. But he is going to stop right there and that's my cue that I can go back in. Now enemies in terms of their patrol or their detection range is a little bit funky in Sekiro. If I'm crouching, it greatly reduces their ability to see me. But if I'm standing in the same spot, they can sometimes see me from like a mile or so away. Now, while we're going back there, I also want to point out that I didn't mention that we do have a grapple arm. Like in Bionic Commando, we can only grapple to fixed points. And those are those little icons you see right there. This allows us to get up and around enemies, as well as deal with them or deal with going around alternate paths. So there was the stealth hit, and he lost one point of health. We still have one more health bar to deal with here. Oh, there's the dodge. Thankfully, I was able to do some dodging. But, again, you can see him trying to cut through my posture really effectively. I'm gonna take a swig of the medicinal gore there. And again, just keep the pressure on. Now, I want everyone to note that about Sekiro. This is a game that is about pressure. But as you can see, we're going to go through. The posture is not going down that fast, or it's not declining, which allows me to just keep at him, and he will eventually succumb in the next few seconds. Now, when your posture breaks, you are left defenseless. And if an enemy gets you with a combo while you're like that, you are basically dead. Now, you just saw me pick up a few items here, and this is the perfect time to talk about progression in Sekiro, while the footage continues to play. So, in the game, you have your health and you have attack strength. Those two are your primary stats. Gone are dexterity, endurance, and all that, and I hope you've noticed that there is no stamina in this game. Instead, in order to improve our friend here, you have to collect prayer beads. You'll find them in the world, hidden, you can buy them in a few shops, but the majority of them you're going to get from fighting mini boss class enemies. When you get four, you turn them in at one of the checkpoints, and you're going to gain increased health, and by proxy, more posture. Which means that it will take more damage in order to break your posture bar. To raise your actual attack, you can only get attack strength upgrades for the most part by beating the main bosses in the game. You basically get their memories which get turned in for increased damage. But keep note that fighting enemies like this does, will never improve my attack or health. I do get skill points, that's the bar in the upper right hand 
corner of the screen that when the bar fills, I basically bank them into one point, which can be spent on a skill tree system. We'll talk a little bit more about that probably in the next few minutes. And of course, I get money which I can use to buy stuff. But a key point about Sekiro's design is that you are far more limited in terms of how you can grow your character out in this game. You don't have various builds or abilities that you unlock, like we saw in the Soulsborne series. You're not going to get new weapons, and you're pretty much adhered to this kind of combat system. And that is both good and bad in terms of playability. It's good by the fact that you don't have to worry about multiple builds or min-maxing, but it also means that if you do get stuck at a fight, or you have trouble learning this game, there's nothing that's going to help you. There's no amount of grinding that will help if you can't figure out these patterns. But, I'm going to skip ahead here to the game's kind of first real challenge, and gate that has stopped a lot of people. The Chain Ogre fight is your first non-humanoid battle, and this can be a pain to fight. First, I'm dealing with this guy right here very fast, and then I'm going to disengage from him in order to get a stealth death blow. While the footage plays out here, let's talk a little bit about why these fights are a lot different compared to fighting the regular humans of Sekiro. The Chain Ogre has so much posture that it's a lot harder to break compared to humanoid enemies. They also do more damage and makes blocking very dangerous. But the biggest threat that the Chain Ogre has are his grabs. And the grabs in Sekiro are very damaging and they're very dangerous to avoid. And there's definitely some calls about hitbox detection when it comes to them. And you'll see that here as this fight plays out. There's also where we get our first death in the game, and we'll talk about the dying and punishment systems as soon as that occurs. But, as with all these bosses, very basic patterns. And you can see right there that I was kind of on the side and it's still connected. And that did, of course, a lot of damage. Oh. But sometimes you can get around things very, very well. But here is our first death. Or I should say, quote unquote death, because we're not actually going to die here. And this is a good time, like I said, we're going to talk about resurrection and what it means to actually die in Sekiro. When you die in the game, you get resurrection orbs. Those are those little, that pink orb you saw above my health bar on the bottom left. These are essentially your lives for playing the game. If you die and you still have a resurrection orb in play, you can come back to life. But you are then unable to resurrect unless you are able to kill an enemy or enough time has passed. Now that time I died without having resurrection, so this is officially considered a death. You can resurrect as many times as you want, and there are no punishments for it. You can return to a Sculptor's Idol to kind of bring back a Resurrection Token. Now you see in the bottom left we have two. But when you die for real, that's when the punishment mechanic of Sekiro comes into play. You will lose about half of your money, or Sen, any percentage of your skill points. Now the game features a recover mechanic called Unseen Aid. And that allows you to not have that penalty, but it's a 30% chance by default. When it does happen, there is if you don't get the Unseen Aid, you lose those resources and there's nothing more you can do. When you die enough times in Sekiro, the Dragon Rod system comes into play. What happens is that several NPCs in the world will become sick. You will not be able to continue their ch quest chain until you fix them, and your unseen aid percentage rate goes down. The second you get one dragon rot, it drops from 30% to 15%, and then will only go down by more than that. And as I said in another video, I am not a fan of that system. 
in previous Souls Likes, as long as you made it back to the boss or your death point, you were able to revive or get your resources and nothing was lost. In this one, you do, you do not get that opportunity. And it's just a punishment mechanic for people who are new. Now there's that little bit of some weird hitboxing going on there as well. And yes, enemies can get pretty unfair in terms of their hit detection, especially these larger enemies. And if you think this is painful, just wait until we get the Demon of Hatred at the end of this piece. But this guy is going to go down despite the number of body slams he is doing to uh, Sekiro's back here. And while this fight finishes up, as a quick note, the reason I'm calling him Sekiro and not Wolf is I'm going by Aizen's designation that he made later on in the game. But again, just picking and choosing my hits, and he is going to go down next 5 seconds. Boom. There we go. No more Chain Ogre, at least for right now. Now, this fight can become trivial if you use the right prosthetic tool. And when we get to the uh, estate, we'll talk more about the prosthetic tools there. But now that we've covered the basic elements of Sekiro, progression, combat, stealth, and dying, we're going to begin to fast forward or skip ahead through a lot of these parts so we can focus on the major topics of the game. Speaking of, we're getting to the first official boss, Jobu here. Now, the game is open to some extent in terms of where you can and can't go, but he is, I think, like the best first boss for you to deal with. Our friend over here is on horseback, and again, you're going to see my defensive style kind of win things out in the end here. Getting those deflects in, and again, notice every time we deflect that it does raise or keep his posture bar growing. Like that hit right there. Again, this is a random pattern, so I don't know what he's going to do. All I know are the kind of attacks that can come from him. So the fight's going to play out, and I can grapple to get to him closer. Oop. And notice the camera also has a way of disengaging when you're dealing with larger enemies when they get close. Now, I could also dodge, but I find the dodging to be very risky in this kind of game. Now he gets stacked, and you notice that a lot of the enemies in Segro in terms of mini boss and boss classes can get stacked, and when they do, you have to go in on that. Took an extra hit there, but he's going to get a posture break in the next five seconds. There we go, and that knocks out health bar one. And the health bars, as the game goes on, are a way to distinguish the phases of boss fights, as each health bar will usually add or change their attack. And here we go again. Ooh. Also, one thing that I am mentioning I should do here while we're watching is that when your posture bar wants to go down, by holding down the block button, it recovers posture faster than when you're just walking around. And again, as long as my health is above 75%, it will go at max recovery speed. Right now, he got staggered again, so that's my cue to do even more aggression on him. Now, if you don't do these grapples, he does get some more punishing attacks. Oh, now, of course, he jumps really high up. But it doesn't matter, as we're going to eventually break. Ooh. Now, I was not expecting an unblockable attack there. And there's an attack that I'm going to be getting very soon, or a counter, that's going to make life a lot easier. Also, pay attention to the fact that if you do not get up off the ground, you are not invulnerable to damage. But he is going to drop very, very shortly. And that should do it. Again, note how I took more damage when I started to get a little bit too aggressive, and the difference when I control the fight. Now, through some magic reason, our horse over here disappears with him. Don't know why, but that just happens. And our reward there was the memory. The memory, again, when we trade that in at the sculptor icons or idols, increases our attack. Now, that's very important 
as again the game is not built on high scaling like in the demon souls dark souls and those games you're not going to be getting like an infinite number of attack or health points so the enemies are kept relatively balanced because of that now what i'm doing right here is going to visit one of the many shops that will sell useful items including gourd seeds and even prayer beads that will allow me to enhance my character now that first item at the, at the top, the Dragon Blood Droplet, that can be used to cure Dragon Rot, and it happens after a specific event has happened. But we're going to slow things down a little bit and talk more about the skill tree system, kind of as we're in this in-between section. The points I've been acquired by killing enemies can be applied to the four different skill trees, starting with the Shinobi Arts, and you'll unlock three different kinds of skills. You get combat arts that will directly add to your attacks during play, but you can only equip one at a time. You get passive abilities that kind of either make it easier for you to sneak around, improve your healing, stuff like that. And you get special, I guess, passive or lane abilities that can become effective during play. One of the most important is a Mikiri, or Mikiri, I've completely butchered that counter. And what that does is provide another way of acting as defense during a fight. Typically, if an enemy does a thrust attack, you're supposed to dodge or deflect it. But using the counter, you can press circle or your dodge button, and Sekiro here will basically stop the sword with his foot. And this does massive posture damage and completely knocks the enemy out of his combo. And all these skills that you're going to get are the main ways you're going to improve Sekiro over the play. As again, you're limited in terms of progression of health and attack strength. And these skills do play a role in kind of helping you out. Especially when you get access to the other trees. But one thing that you'll find is that outside of the counter move, there really isn't like the uh, smoking gun skill. That one ability is going to make everything easier for you. And there have already been people who have played through Sekiro without putting any skill points in and probably even not getting any health or attack upgrades. But as the footage plays out, we're in one of the two areas that are kind of separate from the main world here. The estate is a secondary area. And while it unlocks pretty early, people who immediately rush this part may find the enemies are a bit harder. But this is also where you'll acquire several prosthetic tools, and we're going to talk more about them now, as again, you're not going to see them in play during this video. The prosthetics in Sekiro are the closest thing the game has to a crutch for players to lean on. And it's a very big difference compared to the previous From Software games. Each prosthetic is a set tool that once a lock can be added to your character, and that's what you see in that empty box next to my gourd in the bottom right corner of the screen. The prosthetics use spirit talismans, that's the currency in the bottom right, I think it says eight right there. Each one uses a different amount. And their role is to provide you with additional functionality and utility. So the first one you get is a shuriken that gives you some long range damage and can also do increased damage to enemies in the air. But you'll also get prosthetics that are just direct counters to specific enemies or strategies. The axe will instantly destroy any shield or giant hat that will protect an enemy. While the firecrackers are perhaps the most OP item in the game which allow you to basically stagger any enemy and completely wreck beast-type enemies when you use them. And it's, from what I've seen, is the best one for speedrunning. What I just picked up right there is the item that you take to the sculptor, the man who gives you your prosthetic arm, to then turn into the axe. Now, the prosthetic tools all have their entire skill tree built around them and you collect materials and other prosthetic tools to upgrade your ones going forward. And it's a fairly robust system. The problem is that, quite frankly, it's completely detrimental to you learning how to play this game and why I didn't use any 
while I play through this run. Because again, this game is designed to be played a very specific way. And learning that and the quicker you do makes this game a lot easier. And again, it breaks the design. And I don't think the developers really did convey both the utility of the prospects as well as, again, the weakness of using them. Now, with that said, though, the firecrackers are probably your safest bet. You get them very early on, and they just work again in almost like 90% of the situations you're going to deal with. I think only like a few optional fights and beasts or monster type enemies are immune to them. But other than that, it is a very weird system to have in this game. In previous ones, again, if you were having trouble with a fight or a specific situation, you could summon characters or other players to help you. Here you have to find those tools in the world. Like right there, those shield guys I just passed, if I used the axe, I could deal with them easily. Otherwise, they become a far lengthier fight due to the mechanics of the play. But, with that said, you're about to see the Makiri counter in action as it's going to be used against this spear-type enemy, and it just really trivializes the fight. Now again, I could take this guy on normally, but it is so much quicker and safer to at least get that initial death blow. And most of the mini-bosses you find in the map are designed around it. But right now I'm waiting for him to do the thrust, here it goes. And I wasn't close enough to safely do the counter. But let's watch here for a second. Now that was a sweep, and again, the enemies all have preset unblockers. Now there's the counter, and once you know what they are, it becomes very easy to counter. This guy goes down, and we're going to skip ahead to the second mini-boss fight for this section, and that is the, I guess, the drunk class enemy. Several of the mini-bosses do repeat themselves over the course of play, and this guy is certainly no exception. He has a very wide and erratic pattern, but he also leaves himself open when he takes a swig of his drink there, which he can then spit out as poison or add to his sword. Now there's a character who helps you for this one fight that you can go and get aid, but I didn't really need it. So I'm heading out into the open here because it's safer to fight enemies in the wider areas where you can dodge around and run around them. But let's watch here for a second. Oh, and he got me with a 180 grab. Not good. The lure is that this guy's a former sumo wrestler. But we're not going to get help. We're just going to take him out. Mono Ia Sumo here. There's the spit. And you do not get an easy access to poison removal just yet in the game. So you do have to be careful about that. Now, it would probably have been better to dodge around. Now that time, again, grabs are very weird in terms of their hitboxes. But with the additional damage I'm doing from fighting Gyogler earlier, he shouldn't be that bad of a fight. Oh, I did a dodge and then I kind of a doubled there. Another thing you'll find is that many enemies who have put punches, kicks, or push attacks tend to knock you out of your block. But yeah, now this time we do the correct move, and then I jump back in. And yeah, I just found it very risky to do dodges in this game. And partly again because of how the enemy tracks you. But he will be going down either by health or by posture in the next few seconds. And then after this, we then turn to the first, I think, real roadblock a lot of people have with Sekiro. And that is the Lady Butterfly but say goodbye to our drunk friend here. But Lady Butterfly is a massive challenge and difficulty spike for new players. She's the first real, I would say, humanoid boss that players will run into. And her design is where you really have to start to learn the rules of Sekiro. Her posture recovers way too fast normally for you to break, so you have to do damage to her health. So here I'm, again, trying to play very safe, going for either deflex or dodges. Whenever you safely dodge an enemy's attack, 
you are given free reign to get a free counter slash. But let's watch for a few seconds. And again, just playing a cool lame light posture recover. That grab again is a very weird hitbox. Ooh. And I misread that there. That was a sweep. But don't worry, we do deal with her here. Now that's an attack we can dodge and then counter. And again, as an enemy's health goes down, they will take more posture damage or it will be hard for them to recover it. Right now, again, I'm just playing it very carefully, going in for attacks. And again, note how mechanical this fight is. Now, with the increased damage I'm doing from having Yobu's memories, that does help this out a lot. Again, just playing it very carefully, not losing my cool. If I had the shurikens, they do counter her while she's in the air. But we took her down. The fight is over. Victory swig there. But wait. Nope. There is a phase two. And for many people, it took hours to just to get through phase one. Now, here's a trick. The more aggressive you are at the start here, you can stop her from going into our second phase, at least for a few seconds. Note those little flying things. They will always do damage to you but you can block or parry to reduce it. Now there's the jump kick again counter. Now by now she should have gone through that move, and again I delayed that quite a bit. Sadly though, because her posture isn't below 50, it's going to recover very fast. You can use snap seeds to destroy those illusions, or you can just run around. I will be making use of the snap seeds for a later boss. And again, I'm just not taking any chances here. If you don't destroy the illusions, they will do this attack. And as long as you just get around a pillar, you're fine. Another thing that I didn't take note of, I won't bring out here, is that you can run while you're locked onto an enemy, and you can run just out of anything. It's a very effective way to make distance and avoid a lot of attacks. Again, and trying to play it cool. So, here she goes again, dodge, and again the camera has this tendency to deselect a character when they're moving around really fast, and it is very annoying and makes this fight a little bit harder as well. And when she does that rapid fire move, you can just sometimes mash the block button. And that can sometimes just get the deflex. I could have dodged that kick there, but again, I was playing this more cautiously. But she is going down, and Lady Butterfly is dead for real now. And with that, the estate is basically finished for this point in the game. So we move forward here. We come to the next boss, and that's the Blazing Bull fight. This is a required fight, and it's one of the more annoying ones, again, because of how the inhuman enemies kind of break the normal rules of Sekiro. Now, this fight is trivialized by having the firecrackers, but again, because I'm a badass ninja, I didn't take them on here. Now, supposedly, you can parry or deflect when he charges at you, and that may stun him. But do the weird hitbox of his uh, bale of hay uh, wear there. It's very risky to do. But usually the best strategy is to get him in a corner and kind of force his pattern into repeating the same attack. But let's watch here for a minute. Now there's a hidden bull fight later in the game that I did not fight in this playthrough because I didn't know about it. But I found out after. Oh, he got staggered for a second. And that was some really good damage. Now his posture, like with most of the monstrous class enemies, does recover a bit slower than the humans, but it still does, and it won't stop until his health gets to about half. 
again. There was another stag. You have to really pay attention to the animations. Oh, we don't care about being burned. But what makes this fight very hard, again, is how unpredictable this guy can be. Unless you force the pattern using firecrackers. But, again, we're not doing that here. Note again how much slower his posture is recovering now that the health is below half. When his health gets to about, I think it's like a 16th or a 32 of the bar left, he will kind of stagger himself. The first time I fought the bull, I also didn't use the firecrackers. But yeah, this is like the best way to avoid him. You can just like stay to the side, keep dodging around. And in a few more hits, he will automatically get stacked. But if you can keep him in the corner, it makes it a lot easier to control. He always does, again, the same kind of attacks. I think in the next three hits, he's going to go down. Am I right? Oh, nope. There we go. Now he's going to bang the wall. <laughs> and you're in no threat once he does that. And the bull goes down. With him defeated, this opens up a major point in Sekiro. And I want to talk about the world progression or the overall progression of the game now, while we have some B footage rolling. The world of Sekiro basically goes through a few changes based on what events you complete. We start out during kind of the daytime here. Once we beat Gentro for the first time, that kind of unlocks, I guess, the snow or midday section. After that, once we complete the final chain of events in the game, we go to evening, which changes up this area, and then one final time at twilight, which is the final part of the game. Ashina Castle here links to the three major mid to end areas of Sekiro. That is the Sunken Valley, the uh, the Ashina Depths, where you fight the Condemned Monk, or Corrupted Monk, and the Temple, the name that I cannot pronounce without butchering it, where we get the Mortal Blade. And for a lot of people, it may be very hard to find those areas, especially if you didn't pay attention like I did on my first play. But this opens up, a, there's a, quite a lot of places you can go to before you fight Gentro. You could actually go fight him now if you wanted to, and maybe on a future playthrough I will attempt that early. But you are free to do these areas in any order that you see fit. And this is pretty much Sekiro's way of trying to ease the difficulty. You can go straight to the castle and fight Gentro to unlock the back half of the game, or you can go to the three areas now and make some progress while getting access to prayer beads. Interestingly, there are no additional boss class enemies that you can fight before Gentro. The rest of the enemies that show up are mini boss varieties. But with that said though, once you know what you're doing, you can speed through very quickly. Now with that said, we're going to fast forward a little bit here and show off one of the more infamous mini-bosses that has struggled or played a lot of players. Seven Spears here is a mini-boss that shows up early in the game, but can easily wreck new players due to the amount of damage, both in terms of physical or vitality and posture. This is the fight that teaches you how to do the Makiri counter or die trying. And it's very risky to fight him normally, of the amount of damage he puts out. Notice that every time you do the McCurry counter and he does that follow move, you can kind of break the AI by forcing him to just keep repeating that. But this is a guy that again has wrecked a lot of people. And notice I'm being a lot more agile around him. Oh, here he goes. Trying to let my posture recover. And I'm trying to bait out his thrust attacks. Because that is the best way to kind of wreck him. Again, try to get a few hits. He should be going for a thrust any second now. 
Now, when he does those sweeps, you can leap over, but unless you completely know every animation that he does, it's very risky. And again, this fight punishes you if you do not perform the right defense. But yeah, you're going to get good at those counters with this fight, or you're going to be in for a lot of trouble. And notice that we have his posture bar relatively high, and he hasn't even dropped below half health yet. I think one... there we go, and he is down. Goodbye, buddy. A lot of players watching this right now just breathe a sigh of relief. But there's one other mini-boss in this area that can be a little bit harder to fight. So this is kind of like a one-armed ninja. Fight. And this enemy type shows up several times in the game, as well as minor enemies as well. He's very unpredictable, and he makes use of a lot of kick and punch base attacks that can really wreck your posture. He doesn't have as much health or posture himself, but that is kind of a way to ease up the fact that he's very aggressive. Now this fight is also a really good example of one of the limitations of Sekiro's design, and it's the camera. Similar to previous From Software games, the camera does not handle close quarters or large enemies well. And this fight is definitely for the close quarters variety. And you actually fight this guy several times in close areas too, just to add to the frustration. But yeah. Again, the trick here is you need to be aggressive, but still pay attention. That kick is the best time to go in for a counter. But yeah, that overhead one, I swear, has some crazy AoE to it. Also, my uh, the camera broke lock again. Ugh. Yeah, I find this guy a lot harder than Seven Spears now, just because of how unpredictable he is. Now, when he kind of lurches back for a second, I find that is a free time to go in for an attack. But he is going to die in the next few seconds, and then we are going to do some major skipping ahead, because if we don't, this is going to be like a 2-3 to three hour long video, easily. But before we get to the main event, I want to show you just a few quick elements that came up before Genshiro. This first one is a fight that really hammers home kind of the visa statement for this piece that we'll talk about in a minute. But this guy is high damage, his attacks cannot be blocked or easily dodged. But getting the parry right just wrecks this guy. And look how much posture damage he takes with each deflect. And here he goes again. I think this will be the kill, possibly. Oh, one more. There we go. That took a long time to get through, by the way. But, this is another quick thing I want to show off. This bell represents Segro's quote-unquote hard mode. If you ring it, all enemies will do increased vitality and posture damage, and you'll get, I believe, like one and a half times more resources for killing them. But, all along the way to the temple here, we have this mini boss fight, which is a kind of a fun little tangent in Sekiro. This guy cannot be hurt, but he does not regain posture. So the whole point of this fight is, well, I'm going to let this just play out and stop talking and let you guys enjoy what happens to this guy. It is time for the main event here. 
and, so, and we're going to get serious. I'm letting the cutscene play out because there is a lot to talk about here with Genshiro here. This is the big test of Sekiro. Genshiro represents the guardian to the back half of the game. If you can't beat him, you will never be able to beat this game. And he represents the test of everything that you've picked up and also represents, again, the main point of this piece. And that is that once you know the trick to Sekiro, this game is broken. And you're going to see me beat him relatively easy throughout this play. In fact, so much so that I had to play this cutscene or he would be killed before I would finish my thought. But Gintro here is this similar fight to the tutorial, except he makes more use of his bow. And the bow is considered by a lot of people to be a very unfair aspect, because he can pull that out and immediately start firing without any real animation break between sword and bow. Now when you hit him while he's in the air, it actually staggers him, and you can kind of get his AI locked into a pattern sometimes by hit him, let him jump up, hit him again, stun him, hit him, repeat. It doesn't work all the time, it doesn't work infinitely, but it's a way of getting extra damage against him. But if Lady Butterfly was the battle that taught you about doing vitality damage to break posture, Genshiro here is the one that gets everything. You need to know how to dodge, parry, Makiri counter, jump, as well as properly read all of his animation tells. Most importantly, I guess as a spoiler for the spoiler video, this is the first three-phase boss fight. There's that bow of this. But again, watch how I try to play things very evenly, or very cool. Keeping it close to him, only hitting him not enough to get a deflect, but letting him do the majority of the work. When he does that jump up in the air and slam down maneuver, he can combo that into different unbreakable attacks. And there's, oh, and that's me actually parrying instead of uh, doing the counter. And there's something, as I was about to say, very fascinating about Sekiro's random pattern design that I don't think anyone else has really picked up on. And it has to do with how the enemy reads the player. I don't know if it happened during this fight. I'm actually watching this as I'm recording it. But it did come up during the Demon of Hatred fight. So if it doesn't show up here, I'll comment on it there. But again, this is considered to be one of the best fights in Sekiro. And I would definitely rank it up there. Probably my number one favorite would be Eyes in the Sword Saint, and that is the final battle of the game's real ending. But, again, for this fight, it is just simply following those patterns. Oh, there he goes, and I could have done more damage there. Sometimes when you deflect an attack, it stuns him or stops him from attacking for a few seconds. Now the jump kick is very unreliable sometimes, I think on smaller enemies. Oh, there he goes again doing this pattern. Now if I was better at deflecting, I could have gone more, I could have just ran off. There he goes. And again, note how I'm reading him. I'm playing these very cautiously, and I'm letting him basically build up his posture instead of going all out. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, because when this battle is done, we're going to spend a few minutes talking finally about why this game is broken. And I hope all of you have been paying attention to how these battles have been playing out, because that really explains the thesis for this piece. But while this cutscene begins to play out, while I was fighting Genshiro here, or at least during his first phase, Again, I was doing my best to let him do more of the work, and if you notice, I didn't attack him into getting him to auto-deflect. Because I find, again, that is how you break some of these enemy AIs. But right now he's going to his third and final phase, where he basically chained up his pattern, and we get introduced to a new mechanic in the form of lightning. And this was a complaint some people I've spoken to had, that the lightning is introduced and is immediately tested without any real chance of practice. It's a trial by fire, but with lightning, <laughs> if that makes sense. 
So here we go. He's a lot faster, but his posture breaks a lot easier in this one. Now there we go. Another parry. So he's going to jump. And this is the lightning counter. If you take the lightning hit while you're in the air and then attack as you drop down, you will redirect the lightning back at him, causing massive damage. I also want you to pay note of the fact that, technically, I have not gotten hit by any one of his attacks this entire round. That's just another bit of some badassness, I guess, for this play. But, like I said, this is why I had to start this whole discussion before the fight, because I killed him pretty much almost perfectly for this section. But that took a lot of time to get through. And while this cutscene plays out and we have some B-roll here, it's time to talk about why things are broken. Despite how reactive or responsive Sekiro is and the variety of enemies and patterns and all that great stuff we see from From Software, this game is still very much broken in its design. And like I said, I've been giving you little hints and tells throughout the last almost an hour of this video so far, and it's time to finally reveal why. Sekiro, despite the focus on random pattern design and the variety of enemies, is very mechanical in how you play it. Like we've shown you so far, every one of the boss fights and mini bosses that you've seen, I've played things very calm, very uh, reactive against the enemy instead of being active against them. And by doing so, it became so much easier to play this game. Because Sekiro is pretty much for the first time in like a full big budget action game, it is defensively minded, not offensively. If you want to look at the complete 180 of this, you can check out games like Bayonetta, Devil May Cry, God Hand, those kinds of games that really put the pressure on you to go all out on enemies to stop them from attacking. If you play Sekiro offensively minded, you are going to be in for a world of hurt in this game because that's now how the enemies were designed. And the game doesn't really telegraph that all that well to players in my opinion. The normal enemies, everything that's not mini-boss or boss class, you want to go all out on them. You just want to keep overwhelming their defense. They can't really counter you. Build the posture, get the death blow, they're done. The bosses and the other enemies, you can't do that. The enemies are pre-designed or pre-programmed to auto-block every attack. And if you attack them too many times, they will auto-deflect and then immediately counter you. What you saw during the Genshiro fight, again, was I was stopping my attack when I knew that he was going to auto-deflect. And by doing that, I was able to kind of force the AI to go on the offensive, and go on the offensive in a way that I knew I could deflect or easily avoid. That also had the secondary effect of keeping the camera and the general game screen stable, which made it easier to read enemy tells and their unblockable animations. And with Sekiro's design from a camera standpoint, it uses the same camera as the previous From Software game. So when the camera starts to get crazy or move around a lot, you can't really respond to enemies. And in a game like this that is so focused on enemy tells and animations, you can't do that. Another big point that I mentioned at the beginning, I believe, is that there is no animation cancelling. Typically in action games, especially offensively Maya ones, you can animation cancel out of attacks, usually either hitting a block or dodge. This is a way to keep the player at the high speed and focusing on the offensive. Because I know that while I'm smashing and bashing an enemy, if they start to react, I can just immediately hit dodge and get out of the way. Not here in Sekiro. If I'm in the middle of an attack, I cannot cancel out of it, and the enemy starts an unblockable or an, un or an uninterruptible attack, I am going to get hit and punished. And those are kind of the two codas of Sekiro. You are going to be punished for making mistakes, and by performing things right, 
you are going to be rewarded so well that, again, it makes the game trivial. The Genshiro fight that you just saw there, that took hours of learning his animations and, again, figuring out what the game wanted you to do. The same thing with that blue Ashima Elite guy and the Lady Butterfly before that. That if you try to play Sekiro your own way and not the game's way, you're going to be in for a rough time. And this is why, for a lot of these boss encounters, that if you have to get the boss's health down, or even kill the boss's health bar through vitality damage, not posture, then you are not doing things correct. Even with some of the layer bosses that you're going to see in this video, once I decide to slow things down, and again, focus on posture and reacting to the enemy, the fights went a lot smoother. And this is another reason why I said earlier that the prosthetic upgrades are pretty much a crutch for players. I was able to beat every boss in this game, including the optional super hard fights, without needing those prosthetic tools. Could I make the game easier? Oh, you bet I could. But I was able to do it without, one as a show of proof, and again, because I knew how to handle these fights. And Sekiro doesn't go beyond that in terms of its design. The game, similar to other From Software titles, has a very sharp difficulty curve at the beginning, but then does not get higher from there. And that's a key limitation of this game or this design. Once you know the trick, everything else just falls into place, and the game doesn't do anything else outside of the Inhuman fights to challenge the player. And it goes back to a very important point about enemy design, that it's all about what the player's options are. You could design an action game that procedurally generates millions of enemies, has hundreds of thousands of animations and attacks and hitboxes, but if I only have two or three legitimate and successful tactics to fight them, then all you've done is design two or three enemies. That's it. And Sekiro is proof positive of that design. I know how to handle every enemy in Sekiro with my focus and my uh, measured play. Doesn't matter what the enemy is, doesn't matter how many health bars they have or their attack combos, I know how to fight them. And that keeps true from the first enemy all the way to the end. With the exception of the Inhuman characters, and like I said, we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about those limitations at the end of the video when we get to the Demon of Hatred fight. But as I've been talking, we have officially passed the halfway point of, of Sekiro here. And from here, it's basically cleaning house in the three main areas and then moving on to the final quarter of the game. But with all this progress that we've done so far, we're going to take a quick Patreon and sponsor break, and we'll be right back as we move, or as I should say, we're going to blaze through the rest of the game next. So we're going to fast forward here to the first of the three major bosses that occur after Genshiro, and that is the monkey fight. The second, I guess, I guess non-traditional boss in Sekiro. We have to chase down these four monkeys. Each one will detect us a different way, and our only option is to get stealth kills or distract them. The green monkey is the hardest unless you can get him over here and ring this bell, which he is the monkey I guess that hears, so we just kind of deafen him and then we go for the kill. Goodbye monkey. As the monkeys die, their ghosts will come back to try and haunt you, and if they hit you, they will cause terror. Terror is a buildup that when the meter fills up, it is an instant kill, and is predominantly featured on ghosts or undead class enemies, which I did not fight all that much during this play, but I have some footage that we'll go over when we get there. But each monkey is built around based on a different way of getting to them, and it's a kind of like a nice old diversion. This battle can either be very long or very short, 
depending upon your luck and the order in which you go after them. So I got very lucky. This guy was just like hanging around here. But now the ghosts are going to come and try and kill me. And here they are. But it's a very different fight compared to the rest of Sekiro. And I'm curious for the people watching, what do you think of this one? Because we've seen From Solver do kind of these quote unquote gimmick fights in the past. Such as that battle with the guy with the giant rings in Dark Souls 3. And the witch fight of Bloodborne. Oh, look at all those monkeys trying to get me here. But, with that final real monkey dead, this actually counted as a boss. If you would believe it. So we get an additional memory. And this also unlocks the path for the game's quote-unquote true ending. Which I did achieve in this playthrough. But, because it's a little bit time-consuming, I'm not going to be showing all the exact steps for it. But, we're going to skip ahead here. As I want to talk a little bit more about a topic we brought up at the beginning. Is Sekiro a Souls League? And I'm going to let the footage of me assaulting the gun for it kind of be the B filler for this. But at the beginning, we talked about whether or not Sekiro can be considered a Souls League, despite, of course, coming from From Software. And I would say, in my opinion, that it is not. Sekiro does not have the same kind of tells or progression curve that a t normal Souls-like has. Like we said, a major part of the Souls-like formula is having multiple ways of getting through a challenge while still providing the player with a higher than normal difficulty curve focused on action RPG elements. There is simply not enough RPG progression or, I guess, crutch for the player to use in order to get past the challenges here. This is predominantly an action game first. This goes from the lack of a lot of skill trees, to no gear, nothing along those lines. Neo would probably be closer to a Souls-like despite its greater focus on action, thanks to its RPG components. And when we talk about RPG design like that, it is both a positive and a negative depending upon the design. It can be good by the fact that it provides players with another means of progressing and helping them their skill isn't good enough, but it also adds a layer of complexity, having to look through all kinds of gear, knowing min-max guides, things like that. And Sekiro does not have that. And as we've said before, if you are skilled enough at this game, you don't need to deal with anything else. And this may be perhaps the easiest Soulsborne game, or I should say not Soulsborne game, that you can possibly do like either a deathless or a low upgrade run once you know what you're doing in the game. But again, that is all built on your knowledge. If you do not get good or figure out again what we've talked about before in terms of combat, you will not be able to beat Sekiro, as the game does not allow for anything but what the developers want you to play. But we're going to skip ahead here. I'm going to ignore the Caterpillar or the Long Arms fight because it's just a very basic battle, just built purely on deflection. And we're going to get to the next big boss, aka, I guess, Angrier King Kong. The Guardian Ape fight is the other very big non-humanoid boss that you're going to fight in Sekiro. And again, it represents a lot of the limitations of the system with its greater focus on hand-to-hand -hand or sword-to-sword -sword play. But here we go. This guy has a lot of very wide, very erratic attacks. And it leaves him open. Now, going back to the importance of the prosthetic tools, the firecracker and the spear directly counter him in different ways. Here we go. He just threw some poop at me. And again, we want to do enough damage to stagger him. And he should be getting one stagger any second now. And he's going to do his little, like, back rub here. And again, notice how long the animations are and the tells that go into them. This is a battle, like, with all the non-humanoid fights, that you have to be the one who's active against them. You can't just stand back and let posture build up. It doesn't work. Goes. 
He should be getting staggered a second time very soon. Oop. But of course, if you're not good at avoiding these attacks, you will get punished for it. Oop. That again, that is a very wide hitbox. He is staggered one more time. And again, if you use the firecrackers correctly here, you can keep him almost permanently stunlocked. But yeah, his grabs are very nasty in this game. And with the crazy hitboxes can easily mean death. And look at that posture buildup too. And you'll find that most of the non-humanoid enemies that you just want to avoid their attacks whenever possible. Now he's staggered once more. Oh, never mind. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But he's about to go down. Getting a little cocky here. There we go. Right in the butt, as you just saw. And the Guardian Ape is killed. Very stylish, I must say. We'll revel in this victory for a second, folks. <laughs> I wonder why I'm keep attacking his body. I don't know. Oh, there we go. And the twist begins as Garni comes back in this form. This is actually an easier form to fight him because he's a lot more predictable. Excuse me, predictable, and you can exploit the AI. And you'll see me do that very quickly. Wait for it. Yeah, I won't get away from that. So when he does like a swing... Oh yeah, and that attack can wreck you if you're not prepared. But he's going to do a three-hit swing very shortly. And if I can deflect, it will set him up for a massive counter. And it's almost like 100% of the time exploitable too, right here. One. Two. He's going to go for... That. And now he's stacked. If I was using the spear, I could attack him with it to do massive damage. But he will also do this with a normal three slice attack as well. Now, of course, the footage is not being high enough to show that. Let's see. There's one. There's a sweep. He should be doing it. When, whenever you are close to him, the Guardian Ape will do that yell attack. And again, notice how easy it can be to kind of force the eye into doing certain attacks. This is the best one. When you parry, that is a guaranteed stun on the Guardian Ape. And leaves him vulnerable to a lot of damage. Now he should be going at it again. But with my reactive play here, this fight was not that bad. In. You can also, if you pay attention, kind of spot when the game decides what attack phase to do next. There right, it goes. As long as you get that last one parry, he will do that upright slam that you can then stun him. Now you should go for a scream. Yep. And again, it's very easy once you play Sekiro enough to spot what animations they'll do and plan around that, or what attacks. So I was not expecting a stun there. Now there are items you can use to get rid of terror, but unless you're really fighting the ghost class enemies, you don't really have to worry about it. Now that time I just missed all the parries. Let's see. But I think the next attack cycle, or the second one after that, the Guardian Ape will go down. There's our sweep. One. Now you can't actually just back up from this attack, but I decided to be a, I guess, show off and go over those stunts. Now this should do it, and the Guardian Ape is dead. But this is actually not the last time you will get to fight him. 
as it is possible to get a second bonus account or to get more prayer beads and additional memory. It's also a lot harder to do. With that said, we're going to fast forward as we just cleared the second of the three bosses that kind of are the guardians to the final quarter of the game. And just to show it all for the next few minutes, this is the second Guardian 8 fight. And normally you can go this way before the first Guardian Ape and completely bypass this battle. But if you do it the other way and kill the Guardian Ape first before coming here into the depths, well then he is back. He's just waiting there for me, I guess. No way to unfortunately get a backstab in on him here. But this first part of this fight plays out exactly as the final phase that we just showed off. Here I'm making use of my badass parrying skills. I don't know if he takes more damage or more parrying at this stage or not, but he should be going for a yellow. Go again. And again, take note with all these bosses that we've been showing off, how I've been able to kind of exploit the AI. I don't think he's going to get the death blow here, but may have to one more attack. Oh, never mind. That was such a badass ninja shinobi that we got. So, the fight looks simple so far, right? And then this happens. He gets a friend. And she is going to make this fight a whole lot harder. As just like in any From Software game, Anytime there are ads, the fights become immeasurably more difficult. Now, if I had firecrackers, they would directly counter this. But again, I was not using prosthetic tools for this play. I got very, very lucky during this part. Similar to the first Guardian 8, there are long animation delays between their attacks that you can make use of once you avoid a single attack phase. So let's watch. And then, unfortunately, the mate came in to stop me. But like right here, this is a good one. Notice how much damage I'm doing to the eight. You can see the health bar at the top there. It does not have a lot. But it's just the added fight that adds to this. And then I decided to just go really all in to try and kill her. Almost got her. Again, once she goes down, things get a lot easier. There we go. And after that, we're just back to fighting the big guy. But, because this fight plays out the same exact way as the last one, I'm going to cut the footage here. If you have the Mortal Blade or come back with it, you can get a bonus ninjutsu power. But, we're going to move forward here and get to the Ashina Depths and the Village, where we fight the Corrupted Monk. So this is a quick little interlude before the Corrupted Monk fight, where you have to deal with uh, this lady here. I'm pretty sure there must be more to the side quest, and as with previous From Software games, there are a lot of these little crazy quests around. But. We'll just quickly go over this fight again, and as always, or as with the rest of this video, you can see how taking a more measured approach really trivializes a lot of the combat. But while this is going, this is a quick time to talk briefly about the New Game Plus feature, and what Sekiro does to make things a little bit harder for the player. When you beat the game, you will get to be able to restart it with all your previous stats and options, and the enemies have their own stats raised up. But the game also unlocks an additional feature that you can turn on at the start that removes your ability to withstand damage when you block. As you see, normally when we block in this game, you do not take any penalty from it unless your posture breaks. But by giving basically back the charm that you get start out the game with, 
you will now take block damage, basically forcing you to either parry or dodge attacks. And that is showing a very interesting way to play this game. But we'll let the footage quickly play out as she is almost done. And again, you can see how the pattern can be very exploited in terms of waiting for her to do that unblockable and then following up with a jump kick. But in the next second or two, she'll go down and then we'll cut straight to the Corrupted Monk fight and talk more about that. As we head into the Corrupted Monk fight, this is the last of the three bosses that will basically stop you before getting the endgame. And this can be a tough fight for new players, as the Monk here recovers posture very fast, will auto resist all damage unless it is done away from her actual block, and this has some very nasty patterns to begin with. But as with before, the key to this fight is going to be getting in close and just basically again explain these patterns. So let's watch here. And this is another very pattern heavy memorization fight. Now she should be doing a thrust any second now. Should be coming. And that is your best time to do the Makiri counter as well. But know how we're not really doing all that much to her yet. Now she can also be very punishing if you get too far away with her jumps. There we go. Now speedrunners are going to make use of the snap seeds that will stun and do damage to her. And I'm going to be using that myself as this fight gets near the end. But again, as you can see, I'm keeping the pressure on, staying close, and forcing the posture to go up. You can also do this as a hit and run fight. But it takes a very long time, believe me, or believe you me that. Now she should be doing one more thrust attack, I believe. There we go, and now I'm just going to go in for some snap seeds. Each one doing damage and stunning. You can only do three of these before she just resists us, but there goes the fight. Again, a so much easier than what you do normally with the hit and run, or what people would do when they first play. And again, that goes with this theme of this video, that once you know the optimal way of playing it, so much of this game gets trivialized because of it. But I'm going to let the footage play out for a second because I want to talk briefly about what happens now. Once you have completed all three of the bosses and gotten all three of the ingredients that you need to sever the immortality that your lord wants, Ashima Castle goes through another change. We get to basically sundown. The area gets attacked by other shinobi, enemies are now roaming the land, and there's a few additional mini boss class enemies. Ashima Castle goes through one final transformation at the very end of the game called Twilight, where the game's super final optional boss, the Demon of Hatred, or Demon of Hate, will show up and kind of wreck you for a while. This is also what opens up the final quarter of the game, and of course perhaps an even more infamous fight than Genshiro, and we're going to fast forward to that one as the footage plays out. But I'm going to go into super fast speed here to show off the two additional fights that show up in Ashima Castle. Also, you could have taken on this ogre here by starting the battle with a backstab, but let's just pretend that I did this on purpose. <laughs> but Chain Ogre is the same exact fight as the first one, but he does more damage to it. And for some reason, I swear that when I play some of these fights, that my dodge doesn't give me as many iframes as other people. And I've watched other people fight some of these enemies, and they can actually dodge through, given like the same amount of time. But we'll let him quickly die here, or I quickly die here. And we're going to go to the other fight as this footage speeds up. And that is this guy here, who shows up near where you go into the valley of the snake. And if you let him 
stay alone too long if you get the first death blow, he gets supercharged, which I almost die because of not realizing that here. And this guy is, well, actually the prelude to yet another one of these guys that shows up in Ashima Castle, where we fought that blue uh, elite, Ashima elite, who does the heavy parry. And we're not going to show this whole fight, but with these enemies taken care of, that basically handles all the new mini-bosses that show up at this stage of the Shima Castle. But it is now time to talk about perhaps the fight even more notorious than dealing with Genshiro, and that is the Owl fight. The final challenge before you get to the near the end of Sekiro is the Owl Shinobi, or the Great Shinobi Battle. And this can be a very tough fight if you don't know what to expect. He has a variety of moves that you have to account for, and he can also interrupt his patterns based on what you're doing. He also has that lovely little smoke ball that can disable your ability to heal. But whenever he does that two shirk and throw, that's a safe time to go in. As before, being measured and staying close is definitely your best strategy for dealing damage. He doesn't have a lot of health, especially if you've been upgrading your attack at this point. But you just have to get in close. And he can be very punishing when he approaches from mid to long range. Let's see. Oh, finally got the dodge to work there. And again, getting those punishes are very important for your survival. I've seen people kind of attack through him when he does that, and that can help as well. Now this is where I started to learn again about why the measure approach does work, because if you basically hit him into the point where he will parry, he will do his own firecracker slash attack that can do a lot of damage as well as build posture. But as he continues to go here, we're just going to watch and let him go down to phase 2 now. But as the footage continues to play out, I hope everyone's noticing why this fight is so much more annoying than Gentro. Owl here knows to keep his distance and thereby allow his posture to recover. And again, a lot of the boss fights in Sekiro are really designed to punish you if you play it defensively. And in a fight like this, you're kind of forced to do that by the fact that he keeps backing up, forcing you to re-engage him. Once you get in close range, it's a lot easier to deal with, but he loves to do that kick. Note those longer combo strings he does as well, as he will do those when he approaches you from mid to long range. But this form should be just about done, and you'll see what he does in the phase two. As you can see, he just really likes to pull out all the stops, doesn't he? In Phase 2, he gets that Smoke Bomb attack that he can then follow up with some heavy moves. Like so. I just get the heck away from him. And again, Owl is really good at making you kind of keep your distance from him, thus prolonging this battle. And he's the only boss that seems to really focus like this. Even the Demon of Hatred still lets you kind of get close repeatedly. He, on the other hand, just doesn't really want to let you get those attacks off. Oh. And again, just getting the heck away. Now, you do fight Owl again, if you're going for the true ending, and as a much harder version of this fight. And I'll show off a little bit of footage of that one for people, but that one did take me a few tries to get through. Now there is his poison that you want to avoid. And there is a gourd and items you can pick up that can cure poison, but I didn't really feel the need for it. But once you get their health down to halfway, again, most of the boss you can then start to really focus on posture breaking. But Shinobi here just does not want to have any of that. And I don't think if you parry that kick, 
if it does anything special for you. Now what's very interesting about this battle as we're watching is again, he his moves tend to combo or chain in a variety of ways. And again, he's a lot more unpredictable than Genshiro. Ooh. Messing up those parry timings. And yes, if he take, gets you on the ground like that, he can finish you or do massive damage. Thankfully I just had a sliver of health left. And a lot of the late game bosses are really good at kind of changing up their pattern or reading or altering it based on what you're doing. I think the Shinobi fights are the only ones, other than the Demon of Hatred, where I had to go for health to kill rather than death blow. Now, if I was playing this with prosthetics, I could be using the firecrackers to distract and keep the engagement going. And that's what's generally considered the speedrun strategy. Goodbye, buddy. But, we're going to show off very quickly the Owl Part 2 fight, and this is if you're going for the true ending like we said. And, this fight is a lot more challenging. He punishes you more for staying at long range, and his pattern is a lot more unpredictable. As the footage shows, I've sped it up about 2 times speed here, because this video is starting to run a little bit long. But I at least wanted to show off this fight. His pattern becomes a lot more erratic, and when he does that overhead slash attack, the game will read whether you are standing in front of him, or if you are to the side or back. And if you are to the side or back, he will cancel that and do a counter slash. Very interesting way of changing up the pattern. But this is a fight where he will make more use of the firecracker throw. Some people have dodged through it, to then attack him, but I found the dodging to be very unreliable, and I don't know if that's just a me issue, or just playing this on the PS4. But this is again where you want to be aggressive, despite his intention on staying as far away from you, as his combos get a lot more dangerous when he runs at you from mid to long range. He does have an attack that you can carry counter, that if you don't, is also very punishing as well. But, as we're going to go through here, he does gain a few little tricks when he gets to phase 2 of this fight. But I believe I am going to be killed in a few seconds. And yes, I just went down by Shuriken there. And you're going to see me do the Makiri counter very shortly. He gets a lot more uh, aggressive with that long range attack in phase 2. Come on, go down buddy. There we go. <laughs> it's kind of funny hearing him at high speed voice. Oh, and there's the camera kind of getting in the way. That was the attack that you can Makiri counter. And gotta be really careful about that owl as he likes to teleport around or throw a giant fireball. And again, notice how long some of his combos get if he engages at you from long range. Not sure how that he got stuck on the pillar there. But this will be, I think, our only real example of fast forward or a uh, high speed play here for Sekiro, the rest of the battle will be going, or rest of the fights will be going back to normal speed for. Thankfully I don't think that fireball ever hit me once this entire battle. <laughs> I don't know, I think I found them easier in phase 2 than I did in phase 1. Really made use of that run too. Now you can sometimes force him to do the long range unblockable by staying at long distance, but if he doesn't do it, that combo of his will just wreck you. But we almost got him. And this is definitely the hardest humanoid battle in the game, and probably the, the second or third hardest boss in my opinion. 
But with him finally defeated, that also sets you up for getting what you need for the true ending. And it is now time to skip way ahead to Fallonhead Palace and the return of an old friend. With the Corrupted Monk here, it is possible to initiate this fight with a Death Blow, which I got, like, very lucky. I'm not even sure how I managed to pull that one off. And that was my first attempt at doing it. But, this fight is a lot easier, at least in the early stages, if you have to face Phase 1. Phase 2 introduces this nasty little thing, which will summon three clones who do some really great job of tracking you. I've seen people go up into the trees and use grapples, but that can also be risky as well, as if they hit you, they can knock you into the pit. And if you run out of health while falling, it is an instant death, even if you have resurrections. And yeah, I just really hate this pattern. Oh, and I also, because it was so long since my last fight with her, I forgot a lot of her tells, which is also not good in a game like this. And that was obviously a sweep. But this part, other than that little shadow, is pretty similar to her first run. -in. Again, just staying close, going for hits, and trying to just keep that posture going. Now I think I'm starting to remember this fight at this point, after I got smacked enough times, I know. Let's see here. Ooh. There we go, that's much better. Snap seeds do not work on this version because of the fact that it is a real one, not an illusion. Now, I think if I did a better job, I may have only had to deal with this at one cycle. I think I was a little bit better at dodging here. You see, they track you from when they spawn. So if you're just constantly running around, that will not protect you because they're going to be spawning in as you're running and tracking. And there's me kind of messing up the grapple. But thankfully, we're going to take her down here, or at least get down this form of her. And then we get one final surprise. I'm not sure what she just did there, or how I just avoided all that. <laughs> Again, the game can be very weird sometimes in terms of those hitbox dodges. Alright, lady, time to go down. There we go. And you would think stabbing someone through the head with a sword would be enough to kill them. Normally it would be right, except her head turns into a giant centipede. This form, it's a lot easier to avoid her attacks, but she gets one new nasty move, and that's the vomit. If that vomit hits you, it builds terror, and the full combo hits, it may completely uh, terrorize you. Other than that, this one seems a lot more manageable. If you stay far enough away, she will do kind of like a spinning jump attack at you. Oh, and there, ooh, that terror almost got me there. And again, there it is. As long as you can stay cool. Ooh. And of course, make sure you know how to block or get around her attacks. It's not that bad. And you just gotta, again, keep an eye out for every pattern they're going to do. Now, she likes to do this spin attack a lot. And if you get good at reflecting, or deflecting, it becomes a lot easier to deal with. And it builds up her posture quite nicely. And I'm getting a lot of damage in simply by the fact that I don't fight her enough at this phase to memorize all of her patterns. I spent a lot of time in the first form of Corrupted Monk. But she will be going down fairly soon. Oh, she got me with the uh, extra hit there. But yeah, I almost died for real during this fight. Also, one thing while this fight is going out is that I could have used one of the droplets that we pick up as a special item to get an additional resurrection point, but I felt like it didn't really serve a purpose since you have to at least kill a phase in order to get your resurrection power back to begin with. But Monk here is dead, and she is dead for real this time. She's not coming back. Goodbye. 
<laughs> but with that said, we move into the game's final area, and that's Fallonhead Palace. And I really like the design of this one. Fallonhead reminds me a lot of some of the self-contained levels that we saw in Bloodborne or the Dark Souls series. Stuff like Anolundo, Sen's Fortress, uh, that Ice City in, D in Dark Souls 3 that I don't remember the name of. Areas like that, where it's pretty much a its own enclosed space. It doesn't connect to anywhere else in the game, so you just focus on it. And the level itself brings some interesting changes to the rules. These nobles in here, if they spy you, they will start sucking up your vitality. And if the bar fills up all the way, it will leave you weak and defenseless unless you can quickly kill them or you die. Now, there's a lot of water here, but there is a guy on a tree, like, out in the distance. If you jump into the water, he will start uh, spamming lightning and kill you. There's also an additional bonus fight of a boar class enemy, which I did not know about until after this recording was done, so I have no footage of it. But one thing that I, or there's a few things I want to point out here. The first, again, is that I like the flow of this level. While it is very wide, as with the other areas of Sekiro, it is also very focused. As you run through the outer area, into the courtyard, and then work your way into the back to then fight the second to final boss of Sekiro. Now another thing that I want to point that we're going to cut the footage here is that we didn't talk about ghost class enemies and I avoided them as best as I could for this run for several big reasons. All ghost class enemies will inflict terror on you and terror is a very nasty effect because when it fills up the bar as we've said it is an instant kill. There are items you can use to recover from it, as well as a gourd you can pick up, but they come very late in terms of the gourd, and the other items are consumables, and I'm not a real fan of that. Now, these warriors can be hit by normal means, Ooh, that was a death terror beam, but the other type of enemies, the headless, can only be hurt by using a consumable known as divine confetti. And Again, I don't like when games force you to rely on consumables in order to make it through a fight, and that's why I just ignore that guy right then and there. There is a headless in the water who is guarding a treasure that I think I may either go for in this piece, or I may have done it beforehand. And as, as you can see, I already killed the guy, so there's no need to worry about <laughs> swimming. But, in order to try and keep things moving, we're going to go forward to our next boss, and perhaps the easiest fight in the game. The dragon fight is a two-part battle. The first one reminds me a lot of when you fought that room full of like monks or whatever in Dark Souls 3 in the palace. For this part, we just have to kill them as quickly as we can, but we can also use these trees here to kind of wipe out an entire crowd of them, as you're going to see. <laughs> Certainly does a lot of progress. When they get down to about half of their total bar there, more aggressive dragons will spawn, but the rules remain the same. Get up, come down, and just wipe out the entire crowd. And this is just more or less the prelude to the main event. But both fights are more or less, I guess, what we would call the gimmick battles that sometimes From Software likes to put in. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, I think, with, um, I forget which boss it was. But, I'm gonna finish this part up really fast. Oh, I remember now, it was the monkeys. All the animal fights, I guess, could be considered gimmicks in a way. But, it is time to fight the big dragon. And this one, again, it's more of a gimmick than anything else, but this is the battle that teaches you how to do lightning reversal. And if you don't do it, well, you're going to be very much out of luck for this one. But other than that, it's a very straightforward battle. Again, kind of weird to have something like this be the second to last boss, or required boss, of Sekiro. Just gotta wait for the lightning to strike. 
And I think just to keep things moving along, we're just going to cut here. And we're going to be moving on to kind of the final battles of the game back in Ashina Castle. So, with the final true battle in Sekiro, it starts out with another round with Genshiro. And I'm not sure if the footage is looking uh, weird just on my on the recorder, or it could be something as it was being recorded on the PS4. But, the first round is fairly simple. This is the final phase of Genshiro that we fought way back, I don't know how many hours ago at the time of this recording. His only new attack is that crazy, almost like lightning or ele elemental slash. But other than that, this is basically your test. If you can't beat him easily at this point, then you have no hope of beating Aizen himself. But, intro is about to go down once again. And again, I'm getting a little too uh, crazy here in terms of my attacks. Almost got killed there too, which is very unlucky. But he'll go down, probably in, like the next combo there. And now we have Aizen. And Aizen, I think, is one of my favorite battles in the game. This is a three-phase boss, similar to the second time we fought Kinshiro. And he works pretty well in terms of, again, the design of Sekiro. Being measured, knowing when to push, when to get away, and, of course, knowing when to avoid crazy attacks like that. But, as you can see, I'm going to try and exploit the AI here. Being very measured and forcing him to try and perform attacks that I know I can reflect or get away from. For some reason, I just cannot dodge those attacks. But, I know what patterns I'm looking for. I got a very lucky deflect there as well. But again, you want to stay close. And this is kind of an MO of Aizen, I think in almost all his forms. That if you get away from him, he's going to punish you with a lot of crazy combos, such as that. You can jump over that attack, but I found it to be very unreliable, at least for me. And again, I just found a pretty standard way of beating him. And at this point in the game, Aizen should be a relatively easy fight for you. By the very fact that you should know how to play Sekiro. And I think this is why for a lot of people who do get to Aizen, you're either going to beat him relatively quickly, or it's going to take you a very long time, if you try to cheese the game or use other elements for him. In Phase 2, he gets this big old spear of his. His combos get longer, but he also gets a little bit slower. Now he's going to try that. And again, you can jump that, but I was just too scared. And as with the previous phase, as with these bosses, I've been trying to focus on parry. Now, whenever he does that uh, thrust, Mikiri counter for the win. Very similar to the seven spear enemies that you fight in that regard. Now, force that. And I hope everyone is noticing about how you can exploit the AI. That back attack is very misleading in terms of its speed. He goes again. And again, I could dodge, but sometimes when he slams and you don't deflect, he goes into an additional combo. But again, notice how much posture I've built up, and he's not even 75% done his health bar. That is really good in terms of posture. Now, I would be surprised if he didn't do one of his crazy attacks very soon. In terms of that win back. And sometimes you get lucky and he does multiple ones of those and we go to phase 3. And in all honesty, phase 3 is nothing. If you can beat phase 2, phase 3 is a piece of cake. Now he's going to do that again. Now he's going to do a jump lightning attack. Probably as soon as he's done with this pattern. Let's watch. No, just went for a long spear. There it is. Lightning reflect. And go for the win here. And interestingly, I died one time before this because I missed the lightning uh, chance. But Aizen is going to be dead very soon. And like I said, I like this fight because it is a great encapsulation of the good of Sekiro's combat system. It's a very measured fight. It rewards patience and mastery. And he doesn't feel as 
over the top crazy in terms of this pattern compared to the owl battles. Or even when you're learning Gendro. Now that time I did get hit. And now I'm going back up. And he is about dead and that is game my friends. I'm going to go quiet here while we let Aizen go out in dignity. And that's why I also say it's Sekiro, not Sekiro. Because that's how he said it there. But that is game. And I'm also going to show you the true ending while we're letting things go here. But we're not done yet with this analysis. There's still one final bit of pain left. And that is the Demon of Hatred. Also, as a bit of a uh, count, I died a sum total of five times throughout the entire playthrough of Sekiro before the Demon of Hatred. I did not even see the Dragon Rod system at all. And that goes back to my earlier complaint, that once you know what you're doing, it's just simply pure punishment for novice players. But the ending is going to play out here. And I'm going to go quiet for a minute and let this play out, but we are not done yet. Let's go. Wagamiko. さようならみんな私は行かねばなりません我らの因果を断ち切るためにとても長い旅になりますそれでも共に来てくださるのですか ありがとう。龍の忍びよ。苦労殿も喜んでおります。参りましょう。西に神なる龍の故郷へ。I know that it was all amazing and fantastic, but it's time for some pain. And we got ourselves the Demon of Hatred, the game's optional super super final boss. And it took me about 30 deaths to get through this fight without using any prosthetics or things like that. The footage that you're seeing is from kind of like my final push towards beating him, so I already got most of the patterns down. But if Aizen represented the best aspects of Sekiro's combat system, the Demon of Hatred represents the worst. We have a boss who is giant, the camera gets stuck on, 
you have some crazy hitboxes like that attack, which I don't even know how you're supposed to really dodge that to begin with. And the battle itself is another three-phase fight. Now, what is very fascinating from a design standpoint is that the Demon of Hatred once again is built on random patterns, as with all the other bosses. But From Software does something very clever with its design with this battle that I think we may be seeing more going forward. And that is canceling out of attack patterns. This was something that I mentioned back during the Genshiro fight. But this is the battle that really makes use of it here. What happens is that during certain attack patterns, the boss will essentially check to see where Sekiro is. And if uh, Sekiro is in a spot that can be hit by a combo, he will continue that combo. If he's not, he will cancel out of it. A big example of this is the Team of Hatred's Fireball Throw Attack. Whenever you are about half to a full screen away from him, he will throw out fireballs that do massive damage. If the first pattern doesn't hit you, if you keep running at him and, you are, and he's still in that animation check, he will throw a second pattern guaranteed every time. And this is again very similar to the Owl fight or the Owl Father fight when he does that overhead smash that we were mentioning earlier. But Demon of Hatred's only real like weakness is that he has very long animation holds, and he can't be staggered at least twice per phase. But like I said, this is a good example of how the combat system of Sekiro is lacking. Because this fight is not built on posturing or on reacting. You have to be aggressive to have any chance of beating him. And even with that said though, you get punished very quickly as you just saw. And there's no real like posture-based uh, focus for this fight because he has just so much posture to begin with. And I just did not enjoy this fight, although I did do a celebratory little mini dance when it was all over. Now what I did right there when I dodged to the right into his firearm, that was one of the things that I learned after getting hit by that three hit combo so many times. And when it comes to this battle, it people have described this as being more of a bloodborne boss, and I think I would tend to agree. It reminds me of that uh, lightning guy that you follow. You have to pretty much be all aggressive to keep him staggered. It's like that, but times ten. And there's our first example of Dragon Rod too on this video. Like I said, I died a good fifteen to twenty times just learning this fight. I've seen people abuse the uh, Beast Finger to stun him, but I didn't do that because I'm a badass shinobi. But again, the boss itself is built on a variety of these kinds of attacks. Similar to the Owl, he likes to jump back, and depending upon what that he does when he jumps back, you have to react to that. Now, one thing that I learned very quickly besides dodging to the right, oh and right there. When he was doing that over leg like stomp, if you're in front of him, when he does that move, he will continue with kind of a fire uppercut. There's the fire orbs that we were just talking about. And again, it's a very dynamic battle, which is great, but again, Sekiro's design just doesn't really allow you to take full advantage of it, in my opinion. Now there, because I was in front of him, he did that. Basically, at this point in the battle, I learned that only hit him like two to three times and then start running. Because he can do this move at any point, and I swear that hitbox is very off. He's going to throw fireballs. And again, I know not to run straight at him because I don't want to get by the second wave. Now, he's going to get staggered probably in the next uh, string of hits by me. There we go. There we go. And he goes down again. But, with that said, I'm going to switch to the footage of my actual win on the Team of Hatred. And we are going to go over my final thoughts on Sekiro. But, the footage is going to cut back to the beginning of the fight so I have the time to talk about it. In the end, I didn't love Sekiro, but I didn't hate it. I think I came to respect the game. 
I think that's the most I'm going to get out of it. Sekiro is a bit disappointing. Like I said, it's hard, I think, for the wrong reasons. And it's so highly focused that you are either going to beat this game almost very easily by the end, or you are never going to get there to begin with. And like I said, the footage that you've seen so far, me kind of just like breaking almost every boss battle in terms of easiness, that took a lot of time to figure out what the developers wanted me to do. And I think one of the very misleading elements of Sekiro is that this is not a continuation in design. Not in the same way that Bloodborne iterated on Dark Souls as Dark Souls iterated on Demon Souls. It's an entirely new game, I think it does suffer from that kind of first game experimentation. Now, considering that I think this game has sold like 2 million copies, we're going to probably get a sequel. Sekiro uh, Shadows Die 4 times, maybe, at some point. And I'm going to be really curious to see what they do to refine and iterate on this design in number 2. Especially with how combat plays out. Will they keep to this like single way or single best way of playing? Or will they try and make things a little bit more accessible or playable for more people? Now, with that said though, I'm curious for everybody who has watched, who has you know, stuck by for like almost like two hours, or we are over I think two hours of video right now, about what were your thoughts on Sekiro, and whether or not you managed to beat the game all the way through. I don't know if people want to see me actually do a full run of Sekiro, but let me know in the comments below. But we're going to let this fight play out here, because there is no way, after like spending three hours fighting him, that I'm not showing you the entire successful run of it. Oh, and you missed this attack from earlier. He does this, starting in phase two, and if any of those fireballs hit, you're in deep trouble. As a very interesting fact, I got him down to basically four hits away from perfect death, or complete death, and then he got me with a last combo string, and I lost the fight. And you'll find that when it comes to the bosses in Sekiro, that once you're able to start getting them down multiple phases, they become a lot easier, because you figure out what their tricks are. And again, here's me doing my best to avoid that just damn run. Again, it still pisses me off, and I'm not even playing it right now, that hit me so many times. And one thing that I'm very curious about as we're wrapping this up, like I said, I played this on an original PlayStation 4. And I know people have played this on the PC or PS4 Pro, and I'm wondering if a lot of my timing issues, especially when it came to dodging, is part of that. And I don't have any proof to say yes or no. Now the camera disengaging, that's just a major bug with the game that I think is in all versions. But having, like, being not able to dodge properly just really frustrated me a lot in this game. And usually I'm really good at that. I used to be able to dance around enemies in Dark Souls. But, let's see. Yeah, we got about another minute or so left of this footage. And like I said, ultimately, I like this game, or I like the design of it, but I don't put it in the same echelon or the same tier as Bloodborne, in terms of really making you feel like a badass. I felt too many things in this game got in the way of that, whether it's the camera, how enemies can kind of just like get through your own attacks, and the limitations of fighting a lot of these enemies. Like I've said, this is very much a my way or the highway kind of design. You can certainly, to some extent, cheese some of these fights or use a sub-optimal strategy for it, but the real way to play this is always going to be the easiest. I'm curious to see what people or speedrunners are going to do with this game, because we've always seen people, I think, get it down to like 30-40 minutes if you're just going for the bad ending. I would say maybe like an hour, or you mean a little bit less than that, if you're going for the true ending. Because again, the game has very little abstraction to it. So you don't need to grind enemies in the same way as you do other Souls likes. And once you know what you're doing along those lines, you may not even need health or attack upgrades. You can just 
push as best as you can. And hope everyone's noticing how we're pretty much dominating this fight, at least in this stage of it. And I think part of it is that when he starts getting so many more additional combos or attack patterns that he can draw from, it becomes a little bit easier to read. Now I ran in here, but I think I kind of stopped very quickly. I think I'm about to get a, a power bomb there. Ooh. But I assure you, despite the fact that I'm almost dead, this is a winning run of this fight. <laughs> but as the fight begins to wrap up here, I'd like to thank everyone who has stuck by for this entire video. Hopefully future dissecting designs will not be this long. I may need to get go on a little vacation after recording this whole video. But be sure to check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the are on science of games. Check out the Discord channel we mentioned earlier. And let me know some other games if you'd like me to do a dissecting design on. Otherwise, I'm going to stop talking here, let the rest of the fight play out, and I will see you all next time for another discussion on game design. If you're looking for a book on design, my first title, 20 Essential Games to Study, is out now. It is available where most books are sold, and it comes in paper, hardcover, or digital copies. This is the perfect book for anyone interested in learning about game design, whether you are a student, enthusiast, or just a fan. And now for a quick thank you to our Patreon backers as well as to our current Game Wisdom sponsors. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below.